open up our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. The title of the message is A Pleasing Life to God. As you're turning your Bibles there, I do want to just mention quickly that, um, that uh, there's a lot of people in the Bible that we read about that we get encouraged by, right? I mean, we think of Paul, we think of Peter, we think of, you know, uh, Bar- uh, uh, the rest of these guys, David and them. And, and we get challenged by their lives. We get convicted by their lives. And, and we learn a lot. So I want to do that today by focusing in on a particular man by the name of Enoch. Enoch has, there's little to say about him, but there's a lot that he did that we want to kind of learn from his life so that we can at least live a life that is honoring to the Lord. So if you're in Hebrews chapter 11, um, can I ask you kindly to please stand with me for the reading of the scriptures? We're going to be from verses 5 through 6. We'll pray. But then also, I want you to have your, your Bibles turn. We'll have, you, you know, another passage. We're going to be going back and forth. will be Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. But we're going to start in Hebrews. So let's go ahead and read together. Well, let me read and you follow along. Beginning in verse 5, this is what we read. It says, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And Father, we come before you and we ask That you would just meet us here today, Lord. That you would help us to to realize the importance of living a life that pleases you. Knowing, Father, that through that life lived, it shows that we truly love you. But Lord, words, words, action speaks louder than words, Lord. So we pray today that as we look into the life of your servant Enoch, Lord, that you would teach us how to live that life. Go before us now. Convict us. Encourage us. Strengthen us. Meet us, Lord. Exactly where we're at. So when we leave these, these doors, Father, we leave with a different mindset, a life changed or challenged. Go before us, we ask now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. So as I mentioned, I want to look into the life of Enoch today. A man that Scripture reveals as one who, who lived a life that pleased God. And then it's interesting to know that it says then that after that, he was no more. And, and I just noticed that it says that he was not found. So they probably were looking for him and he was gone. But he was a man that pleased God and a man who was no more. And this shows us this was a man who walked with God. Now, here's some information for you note takers. Enoch is first mentioned in the book of Genesis chapter 5 verse 18 and, and as being begotten by Jared. And then in verses 21 through 24 of Genesis chapter 5, you read a little bit more about this person named Enoch. Now, when you get to verse 24 of Genesis 5, we're told also uh, that Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him or he was taken away, so he didn't see death. So pretty much, you know, the New Testament here in Hebrews is a commentary of the Old Testament in Genesis. But we do know that Enoch's life, was and is a picture of, a, of prophecy, is a picture and a prophecy of what's to come regarding the church of Christ. Now, we know, we they teach here at Calvary Chapel Chino Valley, we believe in what is called the rapture of the church. And we're going to talk about that by the end of our message. But we do know that as he was walking with God, he was caught up to heaven. He never experienced death. In fact, the main emphasis on his, uh, on, on, on his life is that he walked with God and therefore God was pleased. And then he was taken up. Listen, and listen closely. If we walk with God, I want you to know that God will be honored and he will be pleased. I want you to understand that scripture teaches us that that's what God wants from us. He wants us to live in a way that pleases him. In Nekai chapter 6 verse 8, the prophet wrote, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to justify, but to justly, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Now, here's my question to you. Are you walking in such a way? Are you walking in a way that honors and pleases God? Can I extend the question by asking this? Is Jesus your passion? Is Jesus 
your passion? Do you wake up every day to want to please him? Because you know you could, right? <laughs> you could please the Lord. Or you can grieve the spirit. We do know that a life of compromise, a life of sin, will grieve the spirit. But a life lived in obedience will honor and please God. But this is what God wants from us. God wants everyone in this room to walk in such a way that pleases him. Now, we're not talking about coming to church and worshiping him. We're talking about bringing your worship to God. Does that make sense? Well, let me kind of try to say it again. It's not coming to church to worship, but bringing your worship here and offering it. That means that you're living a life of worship at home. You hear me? That means that every day you're living a life that honors God and worships God. So again, the reason why I say that is because I notice that many act different when they are in church than when they are at home. You see, at church, they'll come in, right, acting like they're Christians or, you know, putting on a row. We say good morning to everyone. Hey, good morning. What's up, bro? What's up? Oh, praise the Lord, right? We, do, we go through the emotions of what Christianity, what we think it is. But as soon as we get home, man, the wife's a witness, the children are the witness, the husbands are, even the dogs are witnesses, right? They, they see you and they run away. My dog does that. But anyways, but we play these roles, right? And when we come to church, I don't know where we, we want to worship, but at home, we're living a different life. You see, we need to understand that we are to be the same here and at home or at home and here. Our life is to be a life of worship that honors and pleases God. Listen, our walk with God inside the church and outside the church shouldn't be different at all. We're to walk with him daily in a way that honors him. Well, Enoch was that type of man. He walked with God and as we read, it pleased the Lord. So what I want to do is spend some time in just looking at some things that Enoch did, and maybe we can apply it to our lives. Well, not maybe. I hope you do. Now, here's the first thing I want you to note if you're taking notes. Enoch had a life of faith. Enoch had a life of faith. Now, I said earlier that we were going to be going back and forth, right, from Genesis to Hebrews. So at this moment, go to Genesis chapter 5, and then put a pen or keep your finger there. That's cool. We just, but we're going to be kind of going back and forth through these two passages. And in Genesis chapter 5, we read in verse 24 about this man who had faith and walked in faith. It says, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So again, Enoch had a life of faith. Listen, it takes faith to walk with God. It takes faith to enter into a relationship with God. And then after that, it takes faith to continue walking with God. God, even as we just read in Hebrews chapters of, um, in uh, chapter 11, verse 6, it's the only way you can please God is faith, pleasing God through faith. So the point that I want to make now is this. Listen, the first step in walking with God is the step of faith, which actually happens when you hear from God. So the first step you take is a step of faith when you hear from God. I remember as my brother was sharing, here's where I got saved. When I was 19 years old, I remember the message was given, and I remember hearing God call me out. And the conversation that I had with God was, look, Lord, I'm going to be straight honest with you. I'm young. I want to party. I want to drink. I want to live life. But I said, but if you can change me, I'll serve you. Man, that was the best decision I ever made. Because God said, hey, I can do that. <laughs> I can do that. And here's the thing that I want you guys to understand. I didn't come here to change my life. I came and God changed my life. Does that make sense? I came here and God changed my life. He put his spirit inside of me. He gave me his word. And then he began to work in me so that eventually the Lord began to work through me and for me. But the point that I want to make is that all that cannot happen until you first hear God. And there might be some people right now, hear me, that don't know Jesus, whether online or here present. And you haven't given your heart to God. Well, I pray that today you will open up your ears and hear what the Spirit has to say. Because this might be the day that, God, that salvation may come to you. But you have to hear from God. And God will speak to you, and as, as I will mention a few moments, in various ways. But know that Enoch got his faith once he heard God. 
We too get our faith once we hear God. He will speak to us, and when we hear him, faith is then given to us. Paul said in Romans 10, 17, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. Now listen, we will never have faith until we first hear from God. Now the word word there is not the Greek word logos, right? But the Greek word yama, which means that which is or has been uttered by the living voice. Things spoken. So God spoke to Enoch. He received him. And then from that point on, it's a whole different thing. His life was changed. God speaks to us personally and intimately. He may speak through his spirit. He may speak through his word, the Bible. He will speak to us through ministers. He will speak to you through circumstances. But God will speak to you. The moment you open up to him, God will grant you the faith that you need to be saved. Now listen to me. At that particular time, once we hear from God, we respond to God, now we can live a life of faith. You hear me? And that is the life that pleases God. Now, I say that because we're told that Enoch in Jude 14, there's no chapters there. It's just Jude and verse 14. We're told, and I'm reading from a different translation. It says this regarding Enoch, that he lived in the seventh the seventh generation after Adam, and prophesied about these people. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones. So the first thing I want you to note is that he heard God. He listened to God, right? The Lord spoke to him. So he took that step of faith. Then after that, he continued hearing from the Lord. And God will speak to us as, as soon as you become a believer. The Spirit is given to you. Then now God will speak to you through his word. And as you're hearing from God, you are growing, you're maturing in the things of the Lord. That's important for us to understand. Because God then gives us the responsibility as he instructs us the scripture to get in the word daily. 24-7 we should be reading this book. This divine inspired book from the Lord, right? We're to read it. So God will then begin to do a work in you. And then eventually he'll start working through you. As he works for you, as he gives you the power and the strength to remain faithful. Well, he was a prophet. Enoch then became a prophet and began to deliver the message regarding the coming. It says the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his own. So Enoch was a contemporary of Adam. And he looked forward through time and saw the coming of Christ with his saints. In fact, it's been noted that Adam was about 622 years of age when Enoch was born. And you can write that down. Here's cross-references. Genesis 3.8, Genesis 5.3 through 18. Now, Enoch heard from God. He knew God, became a prophet of God, and then he became, he was able to walk in faith. So he, his walk was a walk of faith his, after he received faith. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you have faith? In the Son of the living God. That's the first thing you need to get right. Then after that, you need to walk by faith. Right? Um, I'll tell you, I've been walking for faith for 28 years now, man. It hasn't been easy. It's been hard. But I can tell you this. God has given me all that I need in order for me to be faithful, which will be, will be in our, our fourth point. But again, he walked with God. He, uh, Enoch walked with God. He had a life of faith. And it was that life that pleased God. Walking in faith pleases God. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Now the second thing I want you to note also about Enoch is that Enoch had a life of fellowship with God. He had a life of fellowship with God. And in Genesis chapter 5 verse 22, as I mentioned, we're going to keep going back and forth. It says this, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years had, and had sons and Daughters, I need you to follow with me as I'm going through these verses. So it tells us that Enoch walked with God 300 years after the birth of Methuselah. Now, I want you to know that Enoch didn't walk with God in easy times, but he walked with God in hard times. In fact, he walked with God in a time of apostasy when people were fading away. Jesus in Matthew 24 verse 37 said, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. In fact, Jesus used Noah's time to show us of things, how things are going to be in the last days. 
So Enoch was living in a time where it was hard, in a time where it was wicked, in a time where sin abounded, just like today. Just like today. I mean, if you look back and you study the life of Noah, right, the times of Noah leading to the ark, it was some wicked times. You know, what was, the Bible says that everyone was doing what, that, what was right in their, own, in their own ways, right? They were stuck in their own ways. They were doing what was right in their own minds. They, they were pretty much calling good evil and evil good. They were messed up to the point where God had to put an end to it. So he walked in a time where things were not right, where things were wicked. You hear me? So listen closely. Enoch, Enoch was a man who was then called to be faithful during this time, in a time of wickedness, in a time of problems where the environment was wicked. Yet he walked with the Lord. Now, I want you to understand this. Listen, we too are to walk faithfully with God in times of trials and tribulations, in these times that we find ourselves now. So, you know what? Let, let, me, let me go back a little bit. He Number two is Enoch walked, had a life of fellowship with God. Before I get and rebuilt on number three, he had fellowship with God. Genesis 5.22, he walked with God. To walk with God speaks of having an ultimate relationship or intimate relationship or sweet fellowship with the Lord. Now listen to what I'm about to say. God saves us to have fellowship with us. Some believe that God saves us to serve him. But it's the other way. He saves us to have fellowship with him, and through that fellowship, we become his servants. Does that make sense? But God wants you to have, he wants to have a sweet, intimate relationship with him. Now, if God wanted to make us his servants, if he was, wanted to save us to serve him, now, wouldn't it be just better to, to make the angels serve him since they do a better job than us? I mean, how many times have we failed? Over and over in our service to God. But when you think of the, of the people or the, or the angels that God used, like Gabriel and them, right? They were faithful. These were, you know, angels that would do the work of God as soon as it was given to them. So if God wanted servants, he would just create more angels. But the point is that God saved us so that we can have an intimate relationship with him. A relationship in which God can hang with you. Now, can I ask you a question? Do you have an intimate relationship with the Lord? Do you wake up every day thinking of God, talking to God, or talking about God? You know, the Christian walk is to be a, a walk in which we're communing with the Lord every day. Every day. I mean, I remember when I first got saved, I shared earlier, I, when I, I, was, I used to be a courier for DHL. And before I would take off, man, I would read my Bible, I would pray, and then what I would do, I would jump in once I had all my packages in the back of the van. I will get to the front, and then I will reach over to the passenger side. I'll grab the seatbelt, and I'll buckle, buckle it up. And then I'll say, okay, Jesus, come on. We're going to go on a ride here. And then I would drive with Christ. I would, man. I would just drive, and I'll be like, people probably thought I was crazy. But I'll be like, hey, Lord, so how was your day? And I'm doing this. And people are like, but that was my moments with the Lord. You know, to this day, I get up in the morning, and the first thing I say is, hey, Lord, how you been, huh? <laughs> How are you doing? You know, I uh, just want to say good morning. And I want to just ask you for one thing. Fill me with your spirit, Lord, so that I can be faithful. And then I get into the word, man. I, I, I dive in. And it, How many of you guys have done this where you open up the Bible and you start reading and then you get lost in time, right? You say you're only going to read five verses or one chapter. Next time I knew you're reading two books, right, of the Bible. And you're like, and you wake up, oh my goodness, I can't believe I, I, I was reading so long. But wasn't that moment sweet and intimate with God? As he's speaking to you, revealing his heart to you, right? And, and as you're spending time with God, you know, you're drawing closer to his heart. You're learning how good he is. He shows you his faithfulness, you know, and all that. And, and it's good because the Bible then instructs us to feed on the faithfulness of God. But God desires that moment that of intimacy with us. He, he saved us so that we can have fellowship with him. And some of us here do have that fellowship with God. And some of us don't. Some of us had allowed other things to get in, in between that relationship between God. And now we're sidetracked and we're off track. Right? Now it's like, it's like God is, you know, constantly trying to reach out to you through messages like today. 
or, or throughout the week that you might hear on the radio where God is constantly calling you to repentance because you allow sin to get in, in, in the way of you and God. And now instead of singing praises and just worshiping and honoring him and blessing him, you know, with, with, with words that are kind words and loving words, you're constantly praying, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me. God wants a relationship with you. He wants fellowship with you. That's why he saved you. He desires to spend time with you, to hang out with you, man. So turn off those TVs, turn off your cell phones, make some time for God. He misses you. He misses you. So Enoch, number two, had a life of fellowship with God, as Genesis chapter 5, verse 22 indicates. Now, some people think that God saved us to make us scholars. Some will come to church and listen to sermons, and, and they'll understand the, mass, the message. But sadly to say, they leave not knowing God. They just want information, but not the transformation. You know, and it's sad. I know a lot of guys. A lot, of, a lot of guys who just want to get, you know, knowledge of God. No, 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 no. But their agenda is different. It's not so that they can allow the, you know, the knowledge to change them and then they can impart it. They, they do it because they like to debate, especially in a time like now that everybody wants to debate. You know, it's sad that even church members, they want to question pastors and teachers and everything just to get into an argument. When that happens to me on Facebook, I just say, you won. Congratulate you, man. I'm moving on. Delete, unfriend, later. You know, I ain't going to get caught in that whole thing. But the reality is there's a lot of people that just want knowledge, but not the fellowship with God. Listen, God gives us his word so that we can know him. You hear me? So that then we can know how to, to love on him. You know, we just heard our brother say that God is good, and I can hear out there all the time. And then, I, and then you know, the other churches would say, God is good all the time. And they'll say, all the time, God is good. I mean, we got that packed down. I mean, it's just something that we say now in church. But at my church, I tell them, but what about saying this? God is good all the time. Well, when are we going to start being good to him? By living a life that pleased him. So, again, number one, Enoch had a life of faith. Enoch had a, a life of fellowship with God, which leads to my third point. Enoch had a life of faithfulness. I went a little bit ahead of myself. But it says that he walked with God for 300 years after the birth of his son, Methuselah. Now, as mentioned, it wasn't a, a, an easy time in which he was living. It was a hard time filled with problems and wickedness. Well, guess what? Today, we are living in such times, aren't we? We are living in such times where there's a lot of problems, a lot of trials. And here's the thing. Sometimes our problems are doubled because we're Christians. I don't know if you noticed, but the church is under attack. It has been under attack for some time now. And when you choose to live a godly life, as Paul instructs us in his letters to Timothy, he tells us that if we desire to live godly lives, we're going to be persecuted. When you decide to say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to live in obedience to God's word. I'm going to be faithful, which is going to be my other point. But, but you know what, I'm going to do what is right. And you start speaking up against abortion, calling it murder. When you get stand up and start speaking about homosexuality, being sin, and you stand up and say, no, that is not true love. When you stand up and you start saying that a boyfriend and a girlfriend living together is not marriage but fornication. When you stand up and you say, no, the use of marijuana, you know, for, for leisure is, is getting high. It's a sin or drunken is a sin and so forth. You're going to get hated. You're going to be persecuted. These are some of the problems that you're going to have to engage in. Some of the trials that you're going to have to go through. But we should not be shaken because Jesus told us this was going to happen. Right? They did it to him. They're going to do it to you. God never called us to a life of comfort, but a life of holiness. And, and when you're living a life of holiness, you can be sure that you're going to have a life with a lot of problems. And that's because you're striving to be faithful. But I want you to know that if you're walking with God, God would, will give you all that you need to be faithful. I want you to think about this. He gives us his son who comes and lives in us. And we have also who will help us to walk faithfully with God. To walk faithfully with God. You see, Enoch had a life of faithfulness. God expects us to be faithful. 
God expects us to be faithful. That's why, like I mentioned, he's given us his spirit to convict us. I have this saying that I say a lot. I say to the church, when we pray, ask God that he will make your convictions stronger than your temptations. That you may be able to overcome and remain faithful to the God who is faithful to us, man. See, we need to have a life of faithfulness. And it is that life of faithfulness that pleases the Lord. Do you have that life? Are you being faithful to God in these hard times? Are you remaining faithful to the Lord at work when your friends are spreading out dirty jokes? When they're, when they're talking about their bosses? When they're stealing on their time cards? You know, if they even have time cards, I don't know what they use now. But are you being faithful? Are you being faithful while you're driving? You know what I'm saying? Some of you guys are going 90. I know I was today. Lord, forgive me. But you know, but it's funny because those, those convictions, like, slow down. <laughs> but I'm running late. And God stopped. Ugh. Even in those little things, God expects us to be faithful, to speak the truth, not to lie, not to steal, not to l- lust. You know, think about it. Are you being faithful? If you are, it pleases the Lord. The fourth thing that I want you to note about Enoch is that he had a life of fruitness. He had a life of fruitfulness, I'm sorry. That means that he's being fruitful in the things of God. He was being fruitful. Jesus said in John chapter 15 that by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And it is through faithfulness that you're able to be fruitful and bring glory and honor to God and please the Lord. Are you being fruitful? Does your life produce those everlasting fruits that brings glory and honor to the Lord. If not, then something is wrong. But we know that in verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 11, we know that it was his testimony. It says his testimony was that pleased God. His testimony pleased God. The life that he lived, a fruitful life, was pleasing the Lord. Now, Enoch didn't appear to walk with God the first 65 years of his life. He walked with God after the birth of his son, Methuselah. Now, notice again, and and, and again, this is a possibility in Genesis chapter 5, verse 22. Notice this. It says, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years, and and, and he had sons and daughters. So it it appears that he walked with God. He didn't walk with God the first 65 years of his life. He walked with God after the birth of his son. Methuselah, for you note takers, was Enoch's firstborn, and he lived until he was, and this is important because I'm going to make help you guys do some math here in a moment. He lived to be 969 years, according to Genesis chapter 5, verse 27. He was the oldest man that ever lived. But it's interesting that Methuselah's names. Listen to this, meant this, when he is dead, it will be sent. His name means when he is dead, it will be sent. So that means that when Methuselah dies, you know what was coming? The flood. The flood. Listen, God always sends a warning before he sends judgment. In Amos chapter 3, verse 7, we read, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. I mentioned earlier that Enoch was a prophet according to Jude 14. And God used this man to go and to warn the people. So God informed Enoch that a flood was coming. And when his baby died, the flood will come. Listen to this, guys. God has been warning the world. Of the judgment that is coming. And he has sent his messengers. In Ezekiel, the Bible talks about the watchmen. Remember that? He said that when you receive a warning from God, that it is our responsibility to go out there and to warn the people. He says, if we warn the people and they don't listen and they get killed by the sword, that's on them. But he says, but if you do not warn the people and the the enemy comes in and he kills them and strikes them with the sword. He says, listen, because you didn't warn them, the blood should be upon your head. God has called us not only to preach the gospel that saves, but also to win, to warn the people of the judgment that is coming. 
And judgment is coming. You hear me? Judgment. God is love, but he's also just. God is love, but he's also a God who, who keeps his word. And in the book of Revelation and in Daniel and other passages, Matthew also, we read about the judgment that is going to take place. And it's going to happen soon, I believe, as we see what's going on in the world today. The world today is going the opposite of what God wants them, where God wants them to go. They're living for self, right? Today the world lives to satisfy the lust of the flesh. Today the world lives to, this, to, to, to kick God out of their lives. They don't want God in their lives. Sin is being received and is being celebrated. Oh, God is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And he has sent his messenger, just like Methuselah, to warn the people. To warn the people of the judgment that is coming. It was a wicked age at that time and God wanted more people to be saved. Methuselah lived so long because God was giving man more chances. But the flood came when Methuselah died. Now I want you to do some math with me here if you're taking notes. We read there that Methuselah was 187 years old when his first son, Lamech, was born. There in Genesis chapter 5 verse 25. 187. Lamech lived to be 182 years before his first son was born. Guess who his son was? Noah. And you read that in Genesis chapter 5, verses 28 through 29. At this point, Methuselah is 369 years of age. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, we are told that the flood came at 600 years, two months, and 70 days into Noah's life. So when you add 187, that's the age of Methuselah, 182, Lamech's age, plus 600 years, you come to 969 years. Guess what? Methuselah died after 969 years, and that's when the flood came. And this speaks to us of the accuracy of the word of God. You can trust the word of God, man. He tells it like it is. And you, you know, I, I believe this book 100% from Genesis to Revelation. I might not understand everything, but I know it's inspired by God. And all the prophecies that, that were, were spoken of Jesus, he fulfilled to the T. All the prophecies that were given in Daniel fulfilled to the T. And I believe that everything else that God said is going to happen, it's going to happen. I believe it. And I see it, which only gives me joy, knowing that Christ is coming back. <laughs> you guys should be excited about that. But I want you to know that it speaks of the accuracy of the word of God, but it also speaks of the patience of God. How God is long-suffering. In fact, in 2 Peter, if you would turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3, please turn your Bibles there. I want to read this to you. Because in it, Again, we read of the patience of our Lord. Second Peter chapter 3, I'll read from verse, from verse 1. It says, Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers or, or mockers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Now, tell me if that's not happening already. Christianity is a mockery in this time. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? They're saying that. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire into the day of judgment and, and, and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, it took 906, 969 years because God was patient. 
He was long-suffering. He wanted more to get saved. And even as Noah was building that ark, it was a call to the people to come and join him and be saved from the wrath that was going to come. But they mocked and they laughed just like today. And I am so grateful and, and blessed that God did not come. Christ did not come 28 years because guess what? I would have been in hell today. Thank God that Jesus didn't come back yesterday because some of you guys right now would have missed it by a day and it would end up in eternity separated from a God who loves us. It is his patience. It is his patience that is being noted here. That's why God didn't destroy the world that soon but waited 969 days for his wrath. God will warn us through his people you are called to be, to warn the people and to love the people too. Amen? But God warns us before he releases his wrath. Just as it, the, as it was in the days of Noah, it will be in our day. God was patient, but eventually he sent the flood. The flood of judgment came and it destroyed all of man. You know the story, except Noah and his family. God is patient with man today. He's long-suffering, but as one preacher one preached, he said, the raging, waters, the, the raging waters of God's wrath are furiously pounding against the dam of his mercy. One day that dam of mercy will give way to the floods of God's wrath, unquote. Right now, God, in his patience, wants to show mercy and grace. But there will come a day with no grace and no mercy will be extended to man. When will that day be? I believe it will be once you're in eternity. Separated from God in hell. Because how many people to right now, right now as we speak, are crying out for mercy, are crying out for grace. But no grace and no mercy is given to them. Because they died either undecided, which is to be decided. They died to be, not to take God's means of provision for salvation, which is through his son Jesus Christ. So listen, one day it's going to happen. The loving God that we all know about will pour out his wrath upon the world. But you can be saved from that wrath as you place your faith and trust in the Lord. Amen. So, let me say Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah. Enoch saw the end and was moved with fear. He was moved with fear and he proclaimed. He preached as Jude 14 tells us. Listen, some today don't believe in a religion built on fear but scripture clearly teaches that the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom in psalms 111 verse 10 and i want you to know <laughs> that those who don't fear god in his judgment don't understand that jesus himself god in human flesh warned us he told us this do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both souls and body in hell in matthew 10 28 you might be arguing with me right now in your mind, disagreeing with this fear tactic. But I will tell you this. I will preach the love of God for God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. But I also will preach the wrath of God that whoever, uh, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Listen to what I'm about to say, guys. I like what one preacher once said. He says, better to be frightened into heaven than to be, than to be sweet-talked into hell. You hear me? So, hey, you want to hate on me? That's cool. But I love you. And that's why I'm telling you the truth. I'm speaking the truth. I, I can share the truth with you, but only the Spirit of God can impart the truth in your heart. And, and which will move you to confess Him as Lord, which leads to salvation. But I want you to know, listen, that he, he Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah. And here's a side note. Once he had his son, he started walking with God. Children would change your life, won't it? One day. I remember when my wife, when she, she was really young, we were not walking with the Lord, so don't judge me now, right? She was 16 when she got pregnant. You know, she had my firstborn, Jonathan, who was seven, you know, uh, I, was, I was, I think, 18 at that time. Well, you don't say nothing. But anyways, <laughs> I had permission from the mom. When we got married, she signed it. I became her, her carer and her husband. But anyways. But when I saw that little boy, something in my heart said, David, you got to stop gangbanging. This is a life. And I remember I moved out here to Chino 
And here's where I got saved. God was orchestrating everything to bring me to salvation. But not only that, it also played a big role in me giving my heart to God. Because when Pastor Rosales gave the message of the crucifixion on Christ, the gospel, I remember sitting there telling God, Lord, I want to party. I want to do this. Change me. And God said, I'll do it. One of the things that was in my mind was my family, my kids. Listen, if anything, allow your kids to change you. And you should be changing for them by giving them the best that you can give them. And it's not money. And it's not fame. It's Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> that's, that's what you should be giving them. You know, when my son Isaac went astray, Isaac was very talented in sports. He got scouted by Boston Red Sox. And I can tell you this, man. Boo, Dodgers. But anyways. <laughs> but I can tell you this. He started going the wrong path. The wrong path. And I remember thinking, man, I don't even care if he makes it to the major leagues. And I remember when my son called me and said, Dad, I'm going to quit college. And I go, why? Playing baseball. He said, because um, they influenced me too much. I can't stop chewing tobacco. I'm getting high, and I don't want to do it. You know what I said? Really? Come on. Man up. No, I didn't say that. I said, come. I said, praise the Lord, man. I don't care, man. I don't even care if you quit college, man. In fact, all they do is indoctrinate you anyways. I say, if you're working at McDonald's, man, any of my sons and my daughter, if they're working at McDonald's, I don't care where they're working. As long as they have Christ, they're rich, and I'm a rich man. So if anything, change. Change for your kids. Change. Do something for them. Bring them to church. Don't leave them home. Bring them here. If you're watching the line and you could have made it, you should have been here with your family, hearing from God, so that then they can go back. Because one, time, one thing I'll tell you this, once they turn 18, it's over. They will make their own decisions. And if you don't pour in as much as you can now, you're going to make it for easy for the enemy and this world to pull them away. So invest in them now if they're young. Now, if you have some kids that are past the age, pray for them. Pray for them. Because God is hearing you. Intercede for them, just like Job did, man. You intercede for them, and you witness to them, and you love on them. Stop being so hard and so prideful and so angry because they're living the opposite of you. Love them for the sake of Christ. And then when you see them saved, oh, your joy will be filled. Amen? Amen. But again, you know, Enoch walked with the Lord, and it was till after. It might be that his son changed to him, and he changed he saw judgment coming and his life became fruitful by living for God, which led to him pleasing God. He pleased God and he was no more. Like Enoch, we too are waiting for the end to come. Amen. And as we wait for the rapture of the church that will transport us into the presence of God, we need to be living lives, living lives that are faith, faithful, Right? No, let me give it to you again. A life of faith, a life of fellowship, a life of faithfulness, a life of fruitness. You hear me? So that when God takes us and we're taken up and transformed instant in the quick of an eye, the blink of an eye, we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. You want to be raptured out while you're serving God, don't you? I mean, I know I do. I wish you could do it right now so I could say, oh, hey, what's up, Lord? I was preaching. I was preaching. But can you imagine if the rapture were to take place and you're doing something that you ought not to be doing? You're going to be like, oh, oh, oh. Can you imagine? I mean, I don't know how it's going to be. But I will hate that. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen. This man walked in a way that pleased God and the Lord took him just like God's going to take us. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses, uh, chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, it talks about the rapture of the church. We're going to be taken. We're going to be minimized. We're going to be transformed. We're going to receive our glorified bodies, which is suitable for heaven. We're going to be in the presence of God from that point on forevermore. Think about it. That's going to be an exciting time. Can you imagine that day when that happens? Look, I had a dream the other day. I really thought it was a rapture. I really did. It was crazy. I, you, know, you know how when you have those dreams and you're like in it? And I remember I was flying. I don't know if we're going to fly or not. But in my mind, I, I love flying. I mean, I, 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 sometimes I look at birds fly, and I'm like, man, that's cool. <laughs> so I, in my dream, I was flying. 
just passing through everyone. And it, I was so excited because I was flying to, towards this, 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 like this golden castle in my dream. It was a dream, okay? Don't say, go out there and tell people, oh, Pastor David saw, you know, a, a castle and a vision. And No, no. I'm just saying what I dream. But I remember as I was dreaming, and my wife said, David, wake up. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, back on earth. I'm excited, though. I'm excited. You know, in Luke chapter 17, Jesus is teaching, and he talks about this glorious day in chapter 17. And it's good, but it's also sad because he says in verse 34, I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken, and the other left, it says. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Or as another translation reads, where, where will this happen, Lord? The disciples asked, and Jesus replied, just as, the, uh, just as the gathering of vultures showed there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. Could you imagine how glorious it's going to be when we're standing before God, Jesus? But could you imagine those who will leave, get left behind? Let me tell you this, as soon as that happened, that sets out the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. We teach that here. We believe that. In the seven-year tribulation, you know how bad it's going to get. Read Revelation and Daniel. Things are going to get bad. And if you think right now, you know what? I don't care what that man over there is saying. El gordito, yeah? I don't care. I'm going to do me. Oh, let me tell you something right now. The enemy has a stronghold upon your life. And you lie and you fell for his lies. You think that you have time. You tell that to all those innocent people that were killed, you know, uh, in, in, in drive-bys, you know, or, 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 or these people that just have heart attacks and that. You really think that they planned their day? The Bible says the point of a man to die once, then judgment. You need to make sure that you are right with God. Because maybe the rapture might not come, but death might come. But if you get left behind, I want you to, right now, let's just picture if it happened. Boom, we're gone. And you look to the side. And you look to the other side. Yeah, you might say, hey, why are you still here? But eventually it's going to come back to you being there. <laughs> Think about it. Now, from that point on, you know already what you're going to have to go through. It's been estimated that maybe, oh, maybe about 2 million people will be left in the world by the time Jesus comes back. With all the plagues and everything that happens, this world will be disastrous, destroyed. If you survive it, what are the guarantees that you'll get right with God? The Bible teaches in Thessalonians that a strong delusion will fall upon those who had pleasure in the flesh, in sin. Because they chose to, you know, have pleasures in that the strong will be part of, will, will be, will come upon them by God. Now listen to this. What if, what if it happens now and then you're sitting there and then you say, I remember David quoted that scripture in Thessalonians or he paraphrased it about a strong delusion coming upon them that they will believe the lie. Therefore it will lead to the condemnation. You know what? You reason. I got left behind. Maybe the strong delusion is going to come upon me. Maybe I'm not going to get saved. You know what? Might as well get the mark and just live out my last seven years to the fullest. Boom. Got it. You're deceived. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but what if? That's it. You're lost for all eternity. You'll never be able to be embraced by the loving arms of our Lord Jesus. You'll never be able to confront Adam for taking a bite of the apple. That's what I'm waiting for. Can you tell? But think about it. It will be the saddest day. All because you chose not to take heed to the warning that God has given us, even through the life of Enoch. Listen, we're not waiting for signs no more because the signs are already here. We wait for the sound of those trumpets where we'll be taken up and forever be with our Lord. It could happen at any moment in the twinkle of an eye, the Bible says. Like Enoch, we could be taken up. Are you ready?
The only way to be ready is to please God. And the way you please God is by coming to the one that he uses through by whom we can be saved. That is his son, Jesus Christ. So we escape judgment, yes. But more importantly, we're brought into a relationship with God where God will speak to you through his spirit and through his word and will direct you and strengthen you and empower you to live a life that is pleasing to God. So here's my question to you. Are you living a life that honors the Lord? If not, you need to get right with God today. You need to get right with God. God is patient. And I'm so glad that he didn't, the rapture didn't happen two minutes ago. In his grace, he's extended his return because he wants you to get right with him today. Why don't we bow our heads?